I think that's, if we have that light one out there, that's quite a good enough light in here. But quite a good enough light. Quite a good enough light. Apparently so. I don't know. I thought that was bullshit. Not Joe. I'm trying to be serious here. Alright, alright. Ah, shit, sorry. James. Two, one, two. We always try to avoid the, the kind of traditional formula of what, what a show is and, and what people expect from a night. Howling Owl is definitely something that doesn't want anything from you other than like your enjoyment <coughs> and your cooperation in terms of like it being a cooperative. They're not like in it for any other reason other than to promote what they like. And it's that's a lot more to invest in as a, as a person who loves music when you see someone and you can tell it's the real thing. Stoked. Just, just, just to, just be, part to be part of it, yeah. yeah. Like these are our friends. And these fact. are people who just create art and make art and need to do it. A few years ago, Devon based noise rockers Joe Hatt and Adrian Dye moved up to Bristol and, not really finding a music scene ready for them to fit into, they built their own, creating a unique record label to release some of the most incredible music in the city and nurturing the growth of a vibrant and diverse underground scene, ranging from the heartbreakingly beautiful. The wildly experimental. Relying on an uncompromising DIY ethic, they've completely rewired the city's life music scene. And supporting it all is a vibrant, open family of artists, musicians, and makers. This is a show about them. And if you want to see the most exciting music being made and performed in Bristol, you have to watch this show. This is the suitably eclectic home of Howling Owl Records, where they do everything from organise the shows to make the album artwork. We're from a very tiny, insular town in North Devon, where the music scene was kind of like was, tepid. Yeah, tepid. Kind of, it was it was all right to, when we were at college and stuff because we were all getting into music and, and stuff like that, but. We were a bit lost, really, um, and so there's not much going on. And it's the kind of place where it's it's really nice to grow up. But as soon as you actually want to start doing something and get, getting into proper music and putting shows on, I think there wasn't really much of a scope to do it there. And I think Bristol was it was kind of it wasn't really a safe bet, but it was the most obvious choice for us to move to because we'd come up a lot to go to shows. Like we used to drive up from 
from Barnstable to, to come to gigs and it just felt like the next the next sort of best step and yeah we did it eventually it took us about a year to actually sort of get our act together and do it um, but then because we'd been playing shows for a year as our band where we just definitely weren't wanted there at all and it just it just gave us a drive to just, just get out of there really. As well as being the creators of Howling Out, Joe and Adrian are also one half of noise rock band Spectres. One of Spectres' earlier shows in Bristol was here at the Louisiana. And tonight it's being played by one of Howling Owl's signings, three-piece garage and sight band Teos Hunt. Previously, he's quite an artist. No, I'm not. not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all just made we just like jam together, didn't we, in, in our house back in the day? Mm. Like we used it was to like do. seven years ago. Yeah, Eight years ago. We like lived together for a long time. Yeah. Just had a had a shared jamming time, mainly like being drunk and stuff and just mucking about late at night and things and then just like got into it. But it took a long time to actually get get going and like take it more seriously. Yeah. I think we had a year year off at one point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 To um, like use a lot of like reverb and stuff, yeah, yeah. and it's like often like sort of like actually sort of difficult to like make out the lyrics, <laughs> but like not not in like no one like a stabbing way, like you know, I, no, it's like cool. You know, is that um like a conscious thing, or is that just you know sort of playing around with like delivery? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say like the reverb, don't really lyrics about the lyrics yeah. that much. <laughs> there's a there's just some like songs that there's definitely is, um more thought out lyrics, mm. probably more from you. I don't know, it's with songs like RC, I don't know, it's not really like a very lyric -y song. <laughs> yeah. With me personally as well, like I really like hip hop music, but like I don't care so much about what they're saying because I'm not really yeah. into rap into hip hop so I like the beats and like the, yeah. the delivery and like the syntax and the tone of it and stuff do you know what I mean like, especially with like lively music I mean RC like Ed literally doesn't sing words it's just like <laughs> gobbledygook <laughs> like, I don't know it's, it's kind of evolved into something <laughs> It's like caring a lot more about lyrics personally. I think it's like realised it is necessary to elevate music beyond a certain level. There's certain kinds of music, do you know what I mean? And when it's like quiet and more considered, obviously, it's worth saying something if you feel you've got something to say. Yeah. If not, then don't bother. Yeah. Just put loads of reverb on it. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys live 
work for the first time. Something that surprised me was the fact that you like change instruments, that you all like mm. switch around like over the course of the set. And it made me wonder like how does songwriting work? I think when we started it was more like it was mainly jamming pretty much. Because that's like how we started playing together, so I was just like mucking about and stuff. So it's basically just whoever was holding what they would play and then hopefully something would come out of it. But like, I think now there's more like distinct, like each person's got a more distinct style on each instrument. Like I'm definitely conscious of that and like say for instance, if I write a song I might rather have like Ed playing drums with Ed on guitar or Matt on drums with Matt on guitar depending on like how their style fits. I think a lot of the time the, dr the drummer kind of ends up being the drummer by default as well because it's not, mm. we don't usually, a lot of the time we don't write songs that, that, that begin on the drums so if two people like write something together then yeah, the person yeah. just becomes the drummer. The one who's left out. <laughs> 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 Pretty much. <laughs> some of the most exciting and innovative music being made and performed in Bristol. But you'll see these artists perform at legendary venues like the Louisiana and Colston Hall and Thecla. And one of the things that makes DIY label Howling Out so interesting is the fact that they tend to put on their own shows in weird, out-of-the-way places, prison cells, scout huts. It's a sort of slightly well documented within our sort of ranks story of when we, we put a show on with the Naturals actually about three years ago at a venue. And we basically got slightly done over in terms of we were naive at how to run a night, the financial side of things, and a lot of things happened and it ended up culminating and us not really being able to put any shows on in other venues. So it kind of made it, it forced us to to look elsewhere. And then it started, the first proper one was the Crypt in Southfield, mm. wasn't it? And there's a Crypt on just off Coronation Road and we put five bands down there, two stages, sort of opposite each other and then absolutely filled it and then we did an after party where we just walked everyone from there to Mother's Ruin and then had Velcro Hooks play downstairs there and that was like this kind of birth of what we're doing now because it meant that it's just and every, every time we do a gig since then we kind of try to have, have a bit of that spirit within it. putting it on and like they might as well put it do it in interesting places and places that are free of like mainstream influence. It's like a kind of like a, a broken model for like small bands and like indie people just trying to do it on their own so you might as well just stick over really and just do it on your own terms as much as possible. to go mm -hmm. to places where you know you're completely taking people out of the context of a gig. So George's birthday today, so happy, happy birthday George. <laughs> How old are you mate? Probably old enough to know guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for The fact that you sort of change 
like time signatures and stuff, mm. and, like structurally, you know, they're very interesting. Like, <coughs> if I can imagine it's kind of difficult to sort of like let loose with it. You know, I can imagine it's the kind of thing where you know, you can't really sort of have like twelve fights, then just go up and just bash something out. Enjoy it, enjoy it, mate. Turn it on the ring. <laughs> Do, do you like enjoy that constraint or do you not see I don't, that? I don't honestly don't find it constraining because I think a, a big part of it is repetition with a lot of things so it's like mm. it's basically like muscle or motor memory do you know what I mean so like especially like Ed like you play such repetitive bass lines but it's yeah like it last like the whole song yeah yeah a lot, a lot of the time I thought you can relax into it it's yeah it's it's still mm. pretty fucking loose <laughs> we've, worked out, we've, got one, that one song. we've got like one Muffy song and we worked out the the actual formula for syncopating rhythms one time, so that was oh, yeah. that was meticulous. We did, we did the maths. I can't remember what it was anymore. Yeah, but we like we reduced it to like the amount. You could, there's like a formula for the amount of bars both things are playing in, and then how many times you have to play them oh, to right. sync up, kind oh, of yeah. thing. But we didn't actually use it; we just figured it out afterwards, and I've forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I found interesting, like as I got to sort of speak to these artists and stuff, was that they don't tend to use the word scene to describe this. Like, you know, they use words like community, uh, collective, like even like family. How would you describe it? You know, scene can be such a positive word, but also it can be really kind of, uh, have really negative connotations. Because people can say, oh, you know, it's really cliquey or exclusive. To be, to be part of that, you know, you have to do this or whatever. Which is something we've always kind of, like, stayed away from. We don't have a, a specific, you know, music taste that we, we think right that's going to be on Howling Owl etc as yeah I think sort of community or I think family we, we as a Howling Owl thing we always sort of do say family because there's so much more than just the bands who we put out or put on with gigs it's the it all started with the people that came to the shows to start with like put, put it like a sort of gave us a chance and, and carrying on coming Obviously, a lot of diverse bands around, but we're all friends and we've watched each other develop as well now, you know, over the last like however many years and stuff. And it's very inspiring to see people. And it's definitely a thing where like go to gigs and I'm like, oh shit, I need to, I wish I sounded more like them. No one's stepping on anyone's toes. It's, it kind of feels like we're all doing our own thing, but together. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs>